Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? People in the back? Yeah? Awesome. Okay. So, the title of my talk is Productive Dissension, What Television Can Teach Us About Writing Games. Uh, and I think there's a, there's, a, there's a curious kind of paradigm in game development that's not exclusive to writing. I think it's true in any collaborative, creative group. Um, just what it's like to work uh, with multiple voices sharing or not sharing a vision uh, of something that's changing even as you're making it. I am a game developer, um, but I've spent some time working in television and film as well. And TV's been doing this for decades, figuring out how to uh, bring a group of different voices, different experiences, different creative uh, artists together, and, and developing models for that group, learning how to produce work um, as, as, as a unit. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So who am I? My name is Zach Harris. I'm the narrative director at Deck Nine Games. We're uh, a new studio on the scene of narrative uh, adventure games. And I've, I've traveled quite a, a ways. Uh, we're located in Colorado um, in the United States. Our current uh, project is Life is Strange Before the Storm, uh, on which I was the, the lead writer. So the first two episodes are out, third episode coming very soon. Previous to that, I worked on a show called Criminal Minds. Uh, before that, the first game I published was Kingdoms of Amalur Reckoning. How many people are familiar with that game? Hey, that's not bad. <laughs> so I was a narrative designer on Reckoning. It was not the first game I worked on. I worked on two open world RPGs that were canceled before we published Reckoning, which is a perfect introduction to game development. <laughs> I'm also a classicist. At university, I studied uh, Latin, Greek, ancient history, ancient literature. So I published a lot of, well, not a lot, but I published some work that no one will ever read um, about the cities. And for the last 10 years of my career, I have been working on a lot of indie projects here and there uh, as I can. Okay, <laughs> what even is this talk? So I'm going to focus on kind of a brief introduction to how a TV writer's room actually functions. I'm going to look at the strengths and some of the challenges that this pretty unique paradigm creates. And then I'm going to talk about how to overcome those challenges when you're working on a game this way. OK, so when I was hired for Criminal Minds, I was hired by the showrunner, the executive producer. Her name is Erica Messer. She's amazing. She told me she has one rule for building a room. It's the one rule she goes by when she interviews writers and assistant writers and researchers and every single role that's going to share that space as that group creates a show. There's <laughs> <laughs> no assholes. When she told me this, uh, I realized, having spent years in game development and, and having Having, honestly, like I love game developers. I think uh, they're the coolest people around. But when she told me this was her rule, this is, what, this, this is what was necessary in Hollywood to choose who to hire, it, it clarified for me that the community I was joining in television might be different from what I was used to <laughs> in game development. Does that mean constipated? <laughs> Creatively? <laughs> yeah, probably so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that rule as we go. Okay. So how does a TV writer's room actually function? Really basic terms. You've got some kind of table, and you've got some kind of collection of people sitting at that table. You have a whiteboard. This is really important. I like to have about 40 to 50 square feet of whiteboard to work with. I can't underestimate, or you can't underestimate, the value of having a space where everyone can be looking at the same thing. On a really, on a high level, on a conceptual level, room work is discourse, it's discussion, it's exchange. And if all you're doing is talking, and you're not putting anything on the wall to clarify and focus what you're talking about, it's incredibly easy to spend four hours accomplishing absolutely nothing. 
staff writer, story editor, co-producer, producer, co-executive producer. This is very Hollywood. These are basically titles that say, I make more money than you do. <laughs> but these are all writers, or creatives who are supporting writers. And then here we have the showrunner. Now, I've marked them in red to differentiate them from the group, and this is really important. It might not always be the showrunner who's working on the board, but the person on the board, and in this case the showrunner, is the person who's clarifying and focusing what the room's working on. It might be breaking a story. Is anyone familiar with the term breaking a story? Something that I see in TV, but not a lot in games. It means talking about the story at a particular level of granularity, where the individual beats or movements of narrative are clarified. It's not so detailed that you need multiple pages, but it's detailed enough that you could walk through the basic moments of the plot, and you should be able to draw from it a clear sense of the arc of the characters involved. Breaking a story is the majority of work that happens in a room. So we have the, the, the person in red, who's the person who's presenting or focusing the problem that the group's trying to solve. And the rest, it's basically a think tank there for you to leverage. And I'm going to talk about this more in a little bit, but I want to emphasize the power dynamic here. It's very particular. There's a, there's a register of exchange that happens in this space that, which might be different from most openly collaborative, creative exchanges, which is to say the person on the board is the person driving. And ideally, they're the showrunner who's the vision holder of the product. But it's their responsibility to leverage the group of incredibly creative people and to focus them and to clarify what we're talking about, what progress means, what questions are the right questions to answer, what an answer even is when you find it. This is extremely difficult to do. It's very easy to spend a lot of time talking about story and not deciding anything. And the responsibility for creating that focus lies on, on the person who's, who's on the board. Okay, so what kind of stuff can we make in a room? I talked about this a second ago, the break. This character does this thing, another character does that, feels this way. Gameplay happens, if you're a game. Something happens with the story. We feel pity, we feel fear, there's a boss battle, and then we have catharsis. Aristotle wrote that. That's the core of what you're doing when you're developing any kind of complex story. Depending on the complexity and the cinematic nature of the story, that can take months, absolutely months. But it's not just plot. It's not just character arc. It's not just moment to moment that you can focus on. I'll spend four hours talking about a character. Pull the room together. Let's get in the room. Let's figure out mm, why does Chloe Price feel this way about David Madsen? That's what I want to talk about, guys. And again, if I'm the red person on the board, I'm the one driving that discussion. I have a, a sense in my head of what I'd hope to get out of it. Maybe we're talking about a theme. Maybe we're talking about a place, an element of our story, like race or gender, or gameplay mechanics. The room is, is just a, a think tank to answer questions or discover questions you hadn't even realized you need to answer. Some strengths. So, it's one thing to have people from all walks of life on your team. It's another thing to figure out how to successfully and functionally integrate their perspectives and their thoughts creatively into the work. And if you can do it successfully, you can prevent the story or whatever kind of product you're producing suffering from my particular kind of privilege or my particular background. You can also generate an enormous amount of content quickly, depending on what your production schedule is like, and they are seldom generous. This is really helpful. This is my favorite, this is my favorite thing. 
The right room can Voltron four more good writers into one super writer. If you don't know who Voltron is, it's that guy. It's basically this giant sword-wielding robot composed of robot cats. Makes total sense. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about my team. This is the biggest strength that we have at Deck 9. It's the writers in the room. And I'm going to go through their backgrounds, their experience, just to frame what's going into the composition of the room as we built it, as I hired them. So John, he has a bachelor's in journalism and creative writing. He has a master's in fine arts from USC, University of Southern California, in film production. It's one of the best film schools uh, in the world. He's done a bunch of indie stuff. He'd never worked on games prior to Before the Storm. But he did teach interactive fiction in enrichment programs for kids. Felice Guan. She studied mathematics in her undergrad. She has a master's in education. She has an MFA from NYU in musical theater writing, where she spent most of her creative career. She also has taught SATs, ACT prep, that's standardized tests in America. And she's tutored mathematics for kids. She likes to LARP, so she's a super nerd. And she likes writing YA fiction. Mallory's getting her associates from the Colorado Film School in Denver, <coughs> located in film production. She has fulfilled everything on set that you could possibly do. She's worked on it. She devours all forms of media, and she hates pretty much all of it. <laughs> what I want to point out with the team is that it's pretty awesome that they have the education that they have. They're fantastic writers, and they've been trained and mentored by other fantastic writers. But for John and Felice, they've also taught extensively. It was really important to me uh, to hire people who both are humble in how they spend their time and have demonstrated the ability to communicate. Being a great writer does not mean you will work well in a writer's room. OK. So challenges. Ego. Really great writers know that they're really great writers, sometimes. There's, an, there's a kind of alchemy to a writer's room that works. And I use alchemy to speak to how mystical it kind of is. It's very difficult to know when you're hiring people how they'll complement each other, how they'll work together. And one bad attitude, one difficult personality can jeopardize the productivity of the room. This one's tricky. A lot of writers are precious about their work. How many people here are sensitive about putting their work in front of anyone? Whether it's the market, because you're releasing a game, or it's a passion project and you're going to share with a friend. Almost everyone's raising their hands. Absolutely, it's natural. A good room does not allow for that. You need to have a willingness to share what you're doing, to talk about what you're passionate about in the context of what's on the table, and to hear your colleague say, I don't think that's good. Your colleague needs to have the right to say, I don't think that's good. And you need to be ready and willing to be like, okay, tell me why. Let's talk about that. And what's required for that is a trust in the expertise and the perspective and the interest of your teammates. I trust John and Felice and Mal. I ask them to, I demand, that they criticize my work. And I know that, that when they are, and when they're really fighting me on something, it's because they very much believe in what they're saying. This is one of the biggest challenges. Coherency of voice and vision across the script can very easily be lost. So, an episode of Before the Storm. If you look at it in the format of like a cinematic script, it's about 1,500 pages. That's the equivalent of maybe five, six feature films. Each writer is working on a part, and it's my job to work with them to make sure that Chloe Price sounds like Chloe Price through the entirety of the story. Okay, yeah, so strong leadership, whatever that might look like. Respect and crystal clear communication 
are vital. And this is just kind of reiterating what I've been saying, but I'm pointing this out because I think on a lot of teams, in my experience in game development and in other creative work, these feel like nice-to-haves. But if you don't have this in a room, you're not going to be able to, to do what you need to do. It's required. So I spoke about this before. If you want to build a room, in my opinion, if you want to create something narratively, collaboratively, with a group of writers, you don't just want to hire great writers. You want to hire great writers who can communicate really well and who are passionate about communicating well. But to be honest, it's really hard to spend a lot of time in the room. You sit there for four hours, six hours, in a group arguing about something, that sucks. You want to take time when you're training and when you're in concept and pre-production to build a common vocabulary. And this can look like anything it needs to look like. I think it's true in all forms of design uh, and creative direction. I make my writers read literary theories that I like. And I use terms that they use to describe work. And I make sure that the whole team understands what I'm saying and we can understand each other that way. This one's a little, well, depending on your dev team, this might be a little counterintuitive. I find a lot of game development to be very egalitarian, and I quite love that. But when it comes to working in a room, it's not a democracy. There are certain uh, challenges you're going to face. There are certain points of discussion, certain ideas in the story where you will not find consensus. You won't find agreement. And it's the job of the showrunner, the vision holder, the lead writer, to make a decision and to move on. Part of that, from my perspective, and maybe I'm speaking to leads now, is that when you're training a room and running a room and you're navigating some of those intense conversations around themes like race and gender, around potentially, like I'll use myself as, as an example, my own privilege as a writer, I need to demonstrate and model a complete willingness to actually listen to and think about the criticism that I receive. And my, my writers see that, it really clarifies for them that uh, the expectation I have of them is something that I'm willing to do too. And I think a big part of how I build the kind of buy-in from writers around supporting a decision I make when I make a decision, if it runs contrary to their instincts, is the make your case rule. I demand that if they disagree with me, they tell me how. They tell me why, and they make the best possible case they can. And I'm committed to listening to it and to weighing it. And if they convince me, great. And if they don't, and they make a decision that runs contrary, there's a kind of uh, covenant we have where they got the shot. And I decided not to, not to follow their direction, and they're going to be OK with that, and they're going to trust me. And one of the hardest things to do as the lead in the room, or the vision holder on the product, is to actually trust yourself. Particularly when the group that you've trained and you've grown to love working with, well, they're really challenging you on something. I think a big part of being a good creative leader in this space is being willing to make a decision that not everyone agrees with because you honestly believe in it and you stick to it. One of the biggest risks, production likes to talk about risk, one of the biggest risks uh, in generating a really complex and robust game script, an interactive narrative, is a head writer or a vision holder who doubts themselves. Usually on a filmic game, like Life is Strange, you are at the beginning of the pipeline. You need to have a certain commitment to a, a compositional velocity, an awareness that maybe it's not going to be the best possible decision, but you need to make a decision you need to create content, and you need to move forward. Because it's very easy to blow your scope way too big, lose funding, and you know what happens in that case. OK, so story's magic. I think everybody in this room has probably found themselves in this room because you already know this, and you believe it in some way. A number of the talks I've seen, which were quite excellent here, 
hint at how brutal this industry can be. The market can be very fickle, production is difficult, schedules are never optimal. Every single game it feels like we're reinventing something or everything. And then the craft itself of writing is just really hard. But I keep returning to this idea myself and my own, my own work that stories magic. So I'm curious, how many of you feel like the best thing that you can do, the best work you're going to make, is something you've already done? Yeah, that's really encouraging. <laughs> I mean, how many people would like to believe that that's ahead of them? I think in my own work, when I struggle with getting a clear sense of what the best thing is that I can do, my dream project, the best version of the project I'm working on right now, when I'm stuck, when I'm gridlocked, counterintuitively, collaboration is what pulls that out of me. It's not about siloing myself off in a cabin and just willing myself to become a better writer. It's the actual practice of getting in a space with other writers and talking about the work. So that's my encouragement to all of you, whether it's like a TV writer's room or any version or adaptation of that that you can find. Uh, share your stuff. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. So you said that you might spend six hours discussing a character. And I guess my question is, what's the kind of output of a character-based discussion going to be? I can see the output of a plot-based discussion. Mm -hmm. how, do you do, how do you capture the character? Yeah. So you'll do, we'll do work before we've written the script to get a sense of who the character is so that we can write it. And then in the act of writing multiple scenes and looking at how shitty it might be, we'll say, wait a minute, the character's actually got to be this way or that. It's this curious kind of back and forth of having a sense of what the work should look like, making work, and then looking at it and reevaluating. It's iteration in that way. So often when we're, I think, working on developing a character in concept or in pre-production, it's a lot of brainstorming. It's a lot of what could this be like? What seems exciting to us? What fits with the other characters that we've come up with? But once we've generated a certain amount of mileage of script, then it's looking at the actual character as the script has portrayed them and saying, is this right? Is this what we want? So sometimes we'll take a step back from doing a scene by scene room work and we'll say, okay, how's Chloe doing right now? Who's Chloe to us having written this episode and half of that episode? And that discussion will either affirm oh, we really like Chloe, and we're seeing her go in a really interesting direction. Or it'll say, the particular constellation of Chloe as she exists in the script now doesn't feel quite right. How? Where can we create changes? What kind of work would this change versus that change do for this scene versus that scene? And the takeaway from that might be, hey guys, we're awesome, let's keep doing what we're doing. Or it might be, let's go back to those specific scenes and try something different. And then we'll see where, where that lands. Yeah. I'm really curious to hear more about what you said about developing a common vocabulary in the writer's room, and I'm wondering where that vocabulary is drawn from, whether it's your personal experience or all the writer's experiences together or a particular source. Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, that could be a talk uh, in and of itself for sure. Um, so I think, I think I like to think about that on two levels. There's the technical vocabulary of what I mean when I say um, embedded narrator, or we saw some really good and very sort of foundational cinematic language of what an extreme close-up looks like, or a push, or a pan, um, or, or Dutch uh, rotation in the camera. It's building, building that, that common sense so that very quickly we can talk about what we're imagining with a technical jargon that everybody gets. Um, and from a literary standpoint, um, I like, I like a, a Dutch narratologist named Mika Ball. She talks about narrative and the study of narrative with really scholarly technical terms that may or may not be useful, um, but I find it useful sometimes. 
Um, and so I, I forced my writers to read her, or, or Roland Bart, who's a really crazy uh, theorist, but he has some interesting stuff to say about how language works and how it structures thought um, and, and how, how narrative works. On a second level though, and I can't, I can't overstate the importance of this, it's not about the technical vocabulary, it's about a personal vocabulary. It's a set of ideas around how we comport ourselves in a room. Not just etiquette, but expectations. This is a different space, and the kinds of conversations we're going to have here might be a little more different uh, than you, you would expect. Elements like building trust that I talked about, and expectations, and showing respect for each other, and how we communicate and what we talk about. It's important not to just assume everybody knows that walking in. And I think if you're the head writer and you're building that team and you're introducing them to that room and you're sitting there and you're talking about, okay, we're going to spend a lot of time together figuring out how to tell a story about depression and grief. It's important to talk about respecting each other's boundaries, about uh, what it might be like, because it can get really intense. If you can imagine on a game like Life is Strange, we deal with really serious issues. We're arguing heatedly. We're drawing from personal experience. <laughs> Uh, figuring out how to talk about talking about it in a way that's supportive and that's positive and that's inclusive, that just doesn't just happen. <coughs> you want to make an effort to build that understanding, to build a sense of responsibility that everyone in that space has to each other. And then you get really cool trust. Uh, and, and then you get, you get writers being willing to tell me I'm stupid. And, and I can be like, awesome, why? And, and it's, a, it's a healthy and a, a productive discussion, hopefully. Yeah? Could you shed a little mm -hmm. light on your iteration and revision process? You mentioned needing to make sure that each episode has a consistent voice or you know, house style. And uh, do, I mean, does, for example, do you ever come back together to read a script and check it? Sure, yeah. So. More is better, and production is king, or queen. Um, so depending on your schedule, we might not have as much time to iterate and review as we like. Uh, but the more we can do it, the faster we can do it, the better the work will be. Typically, I like two full passes on the script. I'll have an outline or a break ready for a writer. We'll meet, we'll discuss my thoughts on the scene, their interest in the scene, where it might go. They'll go off and they'll do a draft. And then when it's ready, we'll review it in the room. And I like doing scene reviews collectively. It's not just the writer who worked on the scene and me, it's all of us. So that the other writers who are working on other scenes can hear what I'm saying and, and share their, thought, their thoughts too. That goes a long way to building that coherency of vision. So it's not just writers siloed off working on different separate pieces of content, but rather we are returning and we're evaluating as a group. Ideally twice, three times if we can. Depends on, on how busy production is and how successful we are. I usually take a final pass at the script on my own to create kind of one last level of coherency and to just change little things that I suddenly care about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, different writers being responsible for different parts of an individual episode. How, how do you decide who's handling what? Is it a case of playing to people's strengths or uh, maybe it's an idea that they've got the most ownership of, yeah. for whatever reason? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I really like putting my writers in situations that they feel uncomfortable in. Um, I mean, I, mean I, like, I like throwing them in the deep end. So I'll see something from a writer where they're really good at very emotional, intimate, cinematic scenes. And I'll, ask, I'll notice that and I'll ask them to do a big, open, free room, puzzly scene. To invest in them. To help them grow. Um, but at the same time, depending on production needs, if we just need to get something done, I'm gonna to go to the writer who can do that fast. Uh, I like to, as much as I possibly can, ask my writers what they wanna work on. We'll have the break, beat by beat, scene by scene of the whole episode. Who wants this? Who wants that? And then it's a giant melee. Um, but actually, it really hasn't been that way. It's been extremely friendly. People just kinda of like, I'm really interested in that. Oh, that's cool, because I wanna do that. Sometimes we can't allow for that, and, and that's okay. I just have to assign work, but, but that's, I, I strive to do that. I think that creates a lot of buy-in uh, from the writers. 
Um, from your experience, uh, do the, the traditional axioms of too many cooks spoil the broth or uh, designed by committee, is there any truth to that in your experience? Yeah, there's all the truth. All the truth is in that. Um, I think like the default, default state of a bunch of writers working together is not good. A lot of what I'm describing is like sort of structural work that we do to counter, counteract uh, the fact that you have all these different individual vision holders who become writers because they have a real clear sense of what they want to make. And when you're working in a room, you're not really making only what you want to make. If you're a staff writer, if you're a junior writer, even a senior writer, if you're not the showrunner, you're making someone else's vision. Ideally, you're sharing in the, the development and the understanding of that vision. If the conversation is good, if the room supports itself. Um, but but your, your default state isn't necessarily incredibly productive collaboration. Like, the act of writing is essentially the act of making decisions. You're just deciding names and dialogue lines and story arcs and plot moments and conflict and obstacles and resolution and it's just a bunch of, that's a million decisions. It's hard enough to do that by yourself. To do that like in a group with other people, I think it's rather extraordinary when it works really well. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I have a group of writers that have an incredible synchrony. They work well together and, and because of that I'm, I'm really protective of anyone else in the room when we're doing most of the work that we're doing. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders in a given uh, production team that'll want to participate at different levels, and you have to be real honest and real careful about what's actually producing good work when you have more people in and what's getting in the way. So I'm, I'm very protective in that, in that sense. Yeah. Uh, in the room, are you able to propose new game mechanics, or are you already know the constraints of what's possible? Yeah, so every project's going to be different. Um, my team on Before the Storm, we're writers and narrative designers. So we write dialogue, we write code. Um, that was another part of why I hired writers who had experience teaching interactive fiction, degrees in mathematics, um, with experience in computer science. Our scripts, our tools, they're designed to look like cinematic scripts embedded in with code that can create branching structures. Uh, all, this, all the paradigms of, of basic coding. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we invent uh, mechanics as we go. And we have design teams who come in and make everything we thought was good way better, um, often, but we were kind of the first, the first effort in that direction. And I found for one of the biggest differences between games and film, we, as writers, creating the more cinematic moments, creating the narrative, creating the heart of the story, we have to think interactively. We have to think through gameplay. It's too easy, it's one of the com most common mistakes with writers coming into games, to think only cinematically. Uh, and, and, and so by forcing that work at our level, I think it keeps us honest and committed to, to the element of games that make games really cool and different from film or, or TV. What is like, like in Deck Nine? What is like dynamic, like working between departments? How does writing work with, uh, let's say, our e department and then modeling and so like how everything connects like with this? Yeah, yeah. So we have, uh, so we have basically four directors um, at our level. I'm the narrative director. We have an art director. We have a gameplay director, and we have a cinematics director. And as the narrative director, I'm kind of the start of the pipeline. And I work with the other three directors a lot in sort of setting boundaries for the story team and what we want to make. But we produce the script. Probably work most closely with the art director in that. Once the script is produced and iterated upon and our publisher's happy with it and we're happy with it, and we take that content into full production, I'm essentially handing off uh, the script to the gameplay and cinematics directors to make it. It's the equivalent of uh, a film writer giving a screenplay to a director and the director running off and making that movie. It's somewhere in between. So in film, director runs the show. Writer might not even be on set. In TV, writers run the show and directors are guests. The final decision is always going to be the head writer. 
executive producer. We live somewhere in between that. Depending on where we're at in production, just how crazy it might be, and maybe I don't have time to, to look into actual production and I'm not involved at all. Or maybe the cinematic director wants to include me and there's time and he can bring me in and be like, I want to shoot it this way, the script wrote it that way, is that cool, what should we do? And we'll collaborate. But it's essentially a kind of a handoff for me uh, with a complete script to the production teams to actually make it. Um, so, entering into a writer's room that's already been sort of established seems like it's an immensely uh, intimidating prospect for a lot of people, um, like me. Um, can, you, um, can you elaborate a little bit on strategies that a, a writer who's newly brought into a team can utilize to make themselves feel less like they're an alien in that world? Sure, yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting question. I would say trust yourself. If they've hired you, it's because they want you there. Um, don't worry too much about having to prove yourself. Believe that they hired you for a reason, and now you're a part of the team. And I think past that, um, I, I, would start, I would start by listening a lot, and being a little more careful about when I involve myself. But I would involve myself. You want to speak up. I think a good room, you'll be encouraged to do so even on your first day. I think a good showrunner will really want to hear from you and they'll make an effort to include your voice. There's, that's why you're there. Um, but I think culturally, every group's different. Be patient um, and, and focus on what you love about it. I think if everybody in that space can do that, then disagreements are easy. You can, you can sort it out. Uh, since uh, Before the Storm is dealing with already established characters, uh, Chloe and uh, Arcadia Bay and, and everything, uh, you're essentially working on creating story beats and character beats and all that from existing material. Uh, so how do you go about establishing a room that's going to be writing about material that has already been established, making sure you don't stray from the original creator's uh, visions for it? Yeah. Carefully. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard. I mean, it, your, your, your claim is partly true. Um, we do have pre-existing characters, but at the same time, we've created new versions of them. We chose to say Chloe at 16 is different from Chloe at 19 for these reasons. Rachel Amber was talked about this way. What is she like in person? Max, who's not there at all, still has a presence. What is that like? What is Joyce like years before? Setting a story three years before, even if it's a prequel, even if there's a lot of inherited concept to work with, there's still a lot of invention required to clarify, to make it new, to make it meaningful, to make it interesting, to make it so that fans of the first game, which is like everybody alive practically, <laughs> will still be surprised, will still be captivated, will still find something that's both familiar and new. Uh, and I think that's a that's really, that's really hard to do. Uh, so part, partly it's, it's bringing in people who uh, really like the kind of material you're working in. That's one of the benefits. You know what Life is Strange is like. So when I'm hiring writers, uh, I can get a sense from hearing them talk about Life is Strange very quickly to see whether or not they understand. They understand the game, they understand that world, they understand that language. And that, that's, that's kind of what I, what I focus on. But at the same time, not having people in order just there to write like the strange fan fiction. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't know the difference between fan fiction and published fiction beyond potentially quality or just the fact that someone paid for it and the person who owned it made it. I think it's absolutely possible that fan fiction could even exceed the quality of core fiction. I don't want to just dismiss that out of the gate. I did a lot of research. Um, I'm going to give a kind of a cheeky answer to that. I think three things. Research. 
I'm a huge fan of research. Um, we read clinicians, we read psychologists, we read grief memoir, we read really bad young adult poetry. <laughs> we read everything um, and thought through it and talked about it. I think it's, uh, it's craft. It's just good writing. Sometimes you don't hit it, but you try. Um, and then I think it's humility. I think that's one of the most important things when you're writing outside of your own personal experience. Honestly, it's probably good when you're writing your own personal experience still. But particularly when you're writing, like I'm, I'm not a teenage girl, um, obviously. And, and I, I would never presume to say I can create that experience completely. I can even speak for that experience as a whole. Well, I can't do that, okay, but I've grieved. I have loss, I can talk about that. And, and I can tell Chloe's story, and kind of focus on her, and not strive to say this is what it is to be a girl, but I can say this is what I think it is to be Chloe right now in her life. And, and, and that's one of the most important aspects of having a room, is that it's not just me, and it's not just my experiences. We have two women in the room who can share their, their perspectives uh, as well. Sure. Yeah. Uh, with an episodic game, obviously you have an episode release while you're working on the rest of the series, and you have an influx of uh, feedback from fans uh, partway through the creation of the series. So how do you <coughs> balance fan feedback and try to incorporate what fans want as such, while staying within the boundaries of what you're already producing and what your vision is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so there's a really horrible version of an answer to that question that I don't think reflects my opinion, but I do think about it from time to time. Henry Ford, who built the Model T, said, if I gave people what they wanted, I would have made fat, or if I asked people what they wanted, I would have said faster horses. Um, and, and he obviously has a certain kind of ego, which again, my presentation warned against. Um, I think if you're getting feedback that's catastrophic, listen to it. Uh, but outside of that, if people are liking it and caring about it enough to argue about it and talk about it, believe in the vision you have and keep producing it. I think user testing is invaluable. Um, that's different from what you're talking about. It's more focused. Uh, but I think in that sense, that's where humility comes in too. You never want to say as a designer, you're playing it wrong, right? Or as a storyteller, you don't get it. If they don't get it, it's your fault. So you want to reimagine how to make them get it, how to help them get it. Um, but I think, I think the, other, the other challenge is just the production schedule. Sometimes in episodic, there is time and room to iterate based on insights the fans have provided. Sometimes there's not, and you just have to keep going uh, with what you've got. Cool, you know? Thank you very much.